Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Nadia Ali. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies at Brown University. And um, um, I can't say it's my great pleasure to introduce today's event because I wish we didn't have to do it, but I'm glad that we're able to bring everyone together to commemorate 20 years of war in Iraq, the costs and consequences. Over the past few days, uh, lots of we saw lots of media reports uh, about the so-called legacy of the invasion and the occupation and i for myself have found it very difficult to try to narrate the impact of the invasion and occupation um how do we do that without um either portraying all of iraq as victims or diminishing the devastating impact of the invasion and occupation. Uh, it's a story of violence and destruction, of lawlessness and chaos, sectarian tensions and conflict, incompetence and corruption, of suffering, loss of life, injuries, destroyed infrastructure, widespread displacement. But at the same time, the, the story of the invasion and occupation in the last 20 years is also a story of survival of coping, of resisting, of trying to continue as, you know, with everyday life, with a sense of dignity, even with a sense of humor and creativity. So today um, we're going to discuss the, the consequences, but also um, the vision and the positive ways of coping. And I'm I'm very glad that I'm able to uh, welcome our four panelists. Um, let me introduce to you uh, Zahra Ali. Zahra is a sociologist and assistant professor at Rutgers University in New York. Zahra currently is in Baghdad. Um, her research explores dynamics of women and gender, social and political movements in relation to Islam, the Middle East, and in context of war and conflict, with a focus on contemporary Iraq. She's interested in empire, capitalism, post-coloniality, transnational feminism, as well as critical knowledge production and epistemologies. Zahra is the author of Women and Gender in Iraq and co-author of Decolonial Pluriversalisms with Sonia Dayan Hasbrun. Welcome, Zahra. Uh, I'd also like to uh, introduce to you Khalid Al-Hilli. Khalid is a PhD candidate in comparative literature at the CUNY Graduate Center. His research is a comparative examination of literary narratives written by Iraqi and American writers, primarily from 2003 to the present. In addition to exploring space and memory, in the contemporary Iraqi novel, his research considers fiction as an indicator of social, political, and historical imaginaries, and explores its role in the construction of racial and national identity in the US and the socioeconomic factors involved in the construction of literary and cultural paradigms. Welcome, Khalid. Kali Rubai is an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at Purdue University. She returned from Iraq last month, where she is conducting two ethnographic projects. Taking toxicity as an analytic for material politics, she's working with a team of doctors, epidemiologists, and environmental activists to document the links between the epidemic of burst effects in Fallujah and military environmental damage. She is also researching the corporate military enterprise of concrete production in post-invasion Iraq and how it enforces global regimes of class and citizenship. Welcome, Kali. Ula Kadum is a postdoctor fellow at Lunds University, working on the ESRC-funded Alteruma project as well as a fellow at the London School of Economics, where she teaches international migration. Ola's research explores religious and political transnationalism of diasporic communities in Europe. 
She is particularly interested in the question of how transnational activism links and networks between global diasporas and their homeland communities are transforming identity politics, nation building, state building, and oppositional movements in countries of origin and settlement. <clears throat> Excuse me. So today's event, I'm, I'm very happy, is co-hosted by the Cost of War project that is uh, housed at Brown. And I have to say, almost every article I've been reading over the past uh, weeks or months that is uh, focusing on Iraq is citing the Cost of War project. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased to be doing this together with my co-host today, Stephanie Savelle. Stephanie is the co-director of the Cost of War project. Uh, she's a public anthropologist of militarism, security, and civic engagement, particularly in relation to the United States post 9-11 wars. Among other publications, Stephanie's global map of US counterterrorism operations has been extensively featured by media such as USA Today and BBC World News. She is the co-author of The Civic Imagination, Making a Difference in American Political Life. Before I'm going to hand over to Stephanie to say a few words of introduction, just to tell you something about the structure of today's event, Stephanie and myself will be in conversation with our four guests, um, and then uh, we will have time for a Q&A. So I'd like to encourage you to put your questions or comments in the Q&A function. Okay, Stephanie, over to you, welcome. Thank you, Nadja. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And um, it's really an honor to to see you know the the panelists and to see all of the participants who are who are here today. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your days to do this. It's really important um, to have this conversation. And I just wanted to say a quick uh, word of introduction of the Cost of War Project, which is housed at the Watson Institute and based on the work of scholars from around the world. Uh, to shed light on the often unacknowledged consequences of the US post 9-11 wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Syria, and elsewhere. Um, though the US officially ended its Iraq war in 2011, the repercussions of the 2003 invasion and subsequent occupation um, continue to have an enormous human, social, economic, and environmental toll. And this war is um, continuing. Just last year in, in 2022, US forces conducted 191 military operations in Iraq against Islamic State militants, um, 122 operations in neighboring Syria. So the US war in this region, as in other regions, is very much ongoing despite US public discourses to the contrary. Uh, in Iraq, my colleague Nita Crawford has just estimated that about 315,000 people have died from direct war violence since 2003. Um, she also estimates that the US will have spent about $2.9 trillion on war in just Iraq and Syria by 2050. This includes the projected costs of healthcare for US veterans through 2050. That's why it goes to them. $2.9 trillion. Um, my own research in a forthcoming cost of war paper documents the reverberating effects of war for human health in Iraq and other post 9-11 war zones. Um, I'm sure we'll hear more about it from the panelists, but the UN economic sanctions of the 1990s caused many problems in Iraq, including that health providers Many of them had to leave, um, and, and the 2003 U.S. invasion really exacerbated this problem. In the five years following the invasion, an estimated 18,000 doctors, over half of those remaining in Iraq at the time, fled the country. And the Iraqi government has yet to fully rebuild its health care system. So the quality of public health care is very poor, and um, many, even those of little means, um, seek, to, seek uh, private care abroad as a result. War, among other factors, has led to um, widespread child malnutrition, and the primary drivers of death amongst Iraqi children under five are preventable, including lower respiratory tract infections, diarrhea, and measles. 
Other costs of war research on Iraq has highlighted war-related displacement, the costs of war to women in particular due to gender-based violence, and the role of US military interventions in contributing to the rise of the Islamic State militant group with its terror attacks throughout the Middle East. Our research also situates the US war in Iraq since 2003 within a longer trajectory of US intervention in Iraq since the 1960s showing that we can only understand the full human costs of war when we see today's war in broader historical context. For the US, as I've mentioned, the budgetary costs of war have been astronomical, uh, matched by equally astronomical profiteering by US private defense corporations. Um, and US veterans have suffered many ill effects of war, including a mental health crisis and skyrocketing rates of suicide. So with that brief um, overview of our research, uh, I'd like to turn it over to the panelists. Um, thanks again for being here today. And I'll just open the panel with a simple question. Uh, what are the most devastating impacts of the US invasion and occupation and ongoing violence in your area of expertise? Um, and I'd like to open with Zahra. Thank you so much. Thank you for the, I mean, for the introduction, for organizing this. Uh, thank you also to the Cost of War project. It's been really a, an amazing resource for, for all of us. So thank you for continuing this amazing work. Um, if you, if, if, if I may, I would like to just to also kind of continue uh, um, before I move on to my area of, of expertise, just to continue a little bit because um, I believe we, we have audience of students, we have a wide audience and it's really the, the 20 years. So if I can continue a little bit um, on, you know, elaborating on what the 20 years mean uh, to us uh, as Iraqis, Iraqis inside Iraq, outside of Iraq, I think that, you know, even, even now it feels um, that we, we talk about it differently when we talk about it in the US, of course. And, and, I, and even this notion, for example, of, of um, I think that the foreign policy tone of what is misleadingly named the Iraq war <laughs> reduces Iraq often to a reality that is really disconnected from people's everyday life in the US. And Iraq now in the US political discourse is described really as a mistake uh, now, uh, or as a, thing, as a thing of the past. Um, and in, in the last decade, the US administration has really washed its hands on the current situation, blaming the Iranian regime, blaming the Iraqi political class for everything that is wrong. And of course, 20 years after the US invasion occupation, not the Iraq war, the invasion occupation, words are not enough, of course, to account for the ongoing tragedy, for the destruction, the devastation that the US has brought to Iraqis. There's something of the incommensurability, right? And, and I think it's something that, that also speaks to people working on issues of decoloniality, of colonialism. There's, there's something where words are really not enough and to, 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 to talk about this tragedy. And thank you for mentioning the, the, the long historical, uh, I think it's very good actually to start in the 60s because for sure, I mean, things that are well documented, but that we don't talk about that much, that actually the revolutionary coup that was uh, uh, that happened in the 50s in Iraq was uh, then followed by a CIA-backed uh, coup that brought the Ba'ath regime in power. I mean, this whole like 70s, 80s uh, story need, need, needs to be told. Maybe not in five minutes now, but, but thank you for bringing it up. I think it's it's very, very important. Um, and as many of, of, of the panelists know, but maybe maybe not the audience, uh, what, what the US administration has done in 2003, I mean, there is a continuity with the 90s, with the sanction, with the, the I mean, before the US led a coalition bombing of the country. What, what continued in, in 2003 uh, is really also setting, I mean, bringing this, this uh, um, political elite from exile, people that have been, uh, away from Iraq from dec for decades uh, to power and also setting up what has been called in Iraq uh, and the Muhasasa system. Uh, we moved on a little bit from the Muhasasa system now in the, in the current discussion, but 
I think it's important to, to, to clarify what it means. It, it kind of, if, if you compare it with the US, it's as if you have a, a country that come and invade the US and put in place <laughs> uh, um, or institutionalize basically racism as, as the base of the political system. And this is what the Americans have done. The, you know, the, the US army, the US administration has done in 2003 is to put in place a system based on ethnic sectarian and religious belonging. And what I talk about most specifically in, in my research is to show that not only the system that was, was put in place in 2003 was a sectarian system, but to use a term uh, uh, coined by my, my colleague Maya Migdash in the context of Lebanon is that it, it was also a sectarian system in the sense that um, if, if really you, you, you look at uh, what happened straight after the, the, the invasion, the very first few months of the invasion, uh, the some of the political forces that came with the US uh, administration, one of the first ref reform that they actually tried to set up is to, first of all, try to destroy the very basis of women's legal rights, the personal status code, and then when they did not succeed, to actually impose uh, a sectarian-based personal status code. So, I mean, women have lost so much in the past 20 years um, in terms of legal rights, in terms of the militarization of the space. I mean, now it's a little less in Baghdad, but however, I mean, uh, we, we, we've been through a sectarian war, we've been through ISIS. Uh, if you walk around, you still see checkpoints, you still see uh, uh, T-walls, you still see, uh, I mean, uh, you still see that the society, the societal fabric has really been impacted. You see uh, hetero patriarchal norms uh, emphasized by, by this general militarization. But as, as you know, as also uh, Nadia put it at the beginning, uh, when we talk about Iraq, we all we don't we don't want to you know draw too much of a of a miserabilist kind of of, of picture. We also want to talk about the beauty, the creativity, the resilience. Uh, and I have I have followed in the past decade now now women's activism, uh, its evolution, fem different feminist groups, and 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 now in the past. I mean, since at least 2011, I've also followed uh, the development of different types of activism, social movements, grassroots activism, youth-led acti activism, and, and maybe what uh, symbolized this resilience and, and this creativity is really what happened in October 2019. Uh, with what is called Thawra uh, Tashrin, uh, the revolution of October, where people took to the street, occupied the streets for a few months, uh, organized really a, a miniature kind of utopian society. And, and um, I mean, I, I think that with, because I've been going back and forth since, since now over a decade, I really see the evolution in the streets. I mean, this movement has really, in, in some ways, I mean, as much as the violence has penetrated every aspect of Iraqi's life, you know, from the privatization of everything from water to electricity to education to health, I also think that then movement of protest and, and forms of resistance and re resilience have also penetrated all, all, all aspects of life. And, and things are really, really changing, not only at the political level, maybe the political level is is the level where we can be the most pessimistic, but at the societal level, at the level of, of um, um, the young generation that really speak freely uh, uh, against the political class that is really organized. Uh, I mean, it, it, the, the slogan of, of Thawret Tashrin of the October revolution was, Enrid Watan, we want a country expressing, of course, what Iraqis have, have lost, a functioning cosmopolitan, livable country with robust infrastructures and services and the possibility of living without fear of being killed by this vast network of armed groups affiliated to the Iraqi establishment for simply expressing their demand to live in peace. However, people are still demonstrating, are still organizing uh, and, and, and I are um, resilient. So I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you so much. I, I think we're going to have Khaled next. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And thank you, uh, Nadia and Stephanie, for organizing this and uh, everyone involved. And uh, I'm so honored to be here alongside brilliant scholars uh, working on Iraq. Uh, my focus is going to be on uh, literature um, uh, the, and more specifically on the, uh, the element of space and how it's being used uh, 
in contemporary uh, uh, and, and Iraqi novel. Uh, so when reckoning with war and its cost, contemporary Iraqi literature offers a nuanced and complex view of the social and political turmoil of the past two decades. It brings to light not, not only its role as a communal and national receptacle of memory, but also the position it occupies in the asymmetry embedded in the power structure of memory, in which, as Viet Thanh Nguyen explains in the context of the Vietnam War, Weaponized memory becomes part of the war machine's arsenal, deployed in the struggle of, to control reality. My research into contemporary Iraqi literature have taken as its point of departure this imbalance of narratives. Reading Iraqi literature with this dynamic in mind brings to light some of the creative, uh, structural, and aesthetic techniques that contemporary Iraqi narratives have put to use. I started this research at a time when US cultural presentations of the war on Iraq, whether in film or literature, had already gained a pervasive cultural presence. The veterans who made their literary debut as novelists had been receiving critical acclaim and recognition, with many being shortlisted for and receiving some of the most prestigious literary awards. A few names come to mind, Kevin Powers, Yellow Birds, published in 2012, uh, Phil Clay's Redeployment, 2014, Young Blood by Matt Gallagher, 2016, all of which are novels written by U.S. veterans who served in Iraq. The experiences portrayed in these works are vastly distinct from those depicted in contemporary Iraqi literature, which despite its remarkable emergence over the past two decades, remains inadequ inadequately translated and underrepresented in discussions about the consequences of war, particularly in the United States. In my assessment of both literatures, and although this may sound, uh, this may come across as a sweeping generalization, but this is part of a, a longer study that I'm working on, a crucial aspect that stands out when comparing Iraqi literature to American war narratives is the connection that the characters establish with their surroundings, with the space they occupy. While trauma, which is frequently the central theme in American war narratives, is portrayed more effectively through time, space is often a constrained element in many of the American narratives, as it is usually experienced and depicted through the narrow perspective of soldiers in a foreign land whose language, culture, and history are often only vaguely acquainted with. On the other hand, many of the contemporary Iraqi narratives are characterized by a critical focus on the creative potential of space. In recent years, there have been significant experimentation in the structuring of space and narrative fiction with a complexity and nuance that is often presented with a sense of political and ethical urgency. Several important critical studies have explored the creative and political potential of space and narrative including the short-lived Hala magazine founded by Lutfiya Dlemi and a recent study edited by Lu'ay Hamza Abbas. These publications also feature some of the most prominent writers of the last two decades. Overall, many of the Iraqi narratives reflect a growing interest in exploring the ways in which space can be used creatively and critically in narratives, highlighting the political and ethical dimensions of such exploration and the importance of literature as a means of understanding and engaging with the consequences of the destruction and transfer transformation of physical spaces as cities, landscapes, and their inhabitants are ravaged by war. One prominent author, the Basrawi Muhammad Ghayir, whose book uh, Basriyatha is considered a superb experimentation in the notion of narrative space presenting a tapestry of the city of Basra that infuses the mystical, the mythical, and the historical in the narrative that is that not only evokes the complexity of space, but also is structured by it. Another example is the uh, Jubaili's 2017 novel, al mashtur Sit Bara' Qayr Shar'iya Li Ijtiyaz Al Hudud Nahwa Baghdad, um, translated The Cloven Six Illegal Ways to Cross the Borders Towards Baghdad. This novel is a profound study of the art of storytelling that presents space as a structural element in narrative form where issues of collective and personal history gain crucial role in the context of war. And I'll speak a little more about this one, this novel. Like Calvino's main character, the Vicon, 
The narrator in this novel, a young man whose name remains unknown to us, uh, has, his, has his body cut in half at the no novel's opening scene, an act that unleashes a gruesome sequence of events. The culprits in this act are two foreign members of ISIS who stop him on a dusty road near one of Iraq's many porous borders following ISIS's territorial expansion in 2014. This triggers a series of bizarre events as the two severed halves soon come back to life. They become two distinct beings with no memory of their former self. They decide to go on a mission with a vague goal of finding a copy of Italo Calvino's book, The Cloven Vicont, believing the book will surely contain instructions that would help them reunite and become whole again. The novel is structured by space, as such as each chapter refers to the side of Iraq's national borders that the two characters try to cross as they continue their journey to get to Baghdad. The space that Jubeli creates is one that summons much of Iraq's history, the Iraq-Iran war, the 2003 US-led war, the ISIS expansion and declaration of the caliphate, Every section of the novel presents an account of another failed attempt at crossing the borders and also creates a world populated by a cast of mostly marginal or marginalized characters, most with an expressed urgency for, st for storytelling. In these spaces, we meet smugglers and drug mules, corrupt border patrol officials, refugees, forlorn lovers, would-be suicide bombers, bombers, skeletons, and ghosts of dead soldiers of Iraq's tragic war suspended in a state of limbo, Bedouins, truck drivers, among many others. Uh, finally, for many Iraqi critics the no and novelists, the emphasis on narrative space brings a political and ethical urgency. Its material specificity stands in contrast with the ambiguous abstractions, not only of earlier literature, but also of the US literature about Iraq where national communal space is often presented as threatening, aggressive, and ultimately uninhabitable. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll turn to Ula. Ula now. Sorry, I probably butchered your name. Can you please say your name again too? <laughs> don't worry, I'm so used to it with my name. It's Ola, but oh. it's difficult to pronounce, so don't worry about it. But thank you so much for having me, Stephanie and Nadia. It's really lovely to be here. It's wonderful to um, see some old faces and meet some new ones. And yeah, it's 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 tough, you know, talking about about Iraq 20 years on. I've certainly found it to be a very emotional journey, having to relive um, the past and also to see how 20 years on we still are experiencing pain and Iraqis are still experiencing pain. And that's something um, both sort of personally and professionally is a, is a great source of anguish for me. Um, but today um, I'm going to be talking about the effects of the um, intervention on the migration and emigration of Iraqis. So um, the legacy of the intervention of Iraq in 2003 and its effect on the migration and immigration of Iraqis is hard to overestimate. Not only did the war preemptively create the conditions for migration, but since 2003 until this day, millions of Iraqis remain displaced internally, while others have become refugees in neighboring countries or have emigrated to Western hostlands. The intervention thus marked a historic turning point for the demise of the Ba'athist regime, but also the migration of millions of Iraqis, changing the country's heterogeneous demographic, exacerbating brain drain and creating uncertain futures for many of Iraq's communities still living in refugee camps or awaiting asylum decisions around the globe. Indeed, according to the United Nations, there remained 1.2 million internally displaced in Iraq and 4.1 million in need of humanitarian assistance and protection. So what is the link between the intervention and the displacement and refugeehood of Iraqis? Well, there are three important factors to consider which have had significant effects on the migration and emigration of Iraqis since 2003, and which are by no means um, exhaustive, but fundamental. Firstly, the institutionalized sister of Muhassasa Ta'ifiyya, built under the auspices of the Anglo-American intervention. Debathification policies, which have led to the marginalization of Sunnis and a catalyst for the rise in extremist groups and ideologies. And finally, the endemic violence that's permeated the country, both physically and sociologically, creating a lack of security and protection for Iraq's most vulnerable communities. 
All I argue have played a significant role in the continued displacement and emigration of Iraqis, and particularly Iraqi minorities who faced existential threats, land grabs, violence, and genocide. So I'll briefly address each one in turn. Firstly, as the intervention in Iraq turned into an occupation, state building in Iraq was officially ethnicized and sectarianized under a confessional system. This empowered the Kurds and the Shia of Iraq, while Iraq's other communities were cast to Iraq's political and social periphery. This led to competing ethnic and sectarian nationalisms in the fight for power, leaving vulnerable minorities in a precarious position in relation to dominant groups and the state. For instance, the disputed territories in northern Iraq, where many minorities have historically resided, have become a battleground for conflict between the Kurdish regional government and Baghdad's central government, leaving Iraqi minorities, including Assyrians and Turkmen, vulnerable to deportation, detention and arrest. Disputed territories and competing nationalisms between the KRG and Baghdad have therefore led to the destruction of many of Iraq's minority communities who, unprotected by the state, have either migrated internally or emigrated to neighboring countries and beyond. Secondly, the marginalization of Arab Sunni populations, policies of debartification and disbanding of the army led to the political and social disenfranchisement of Iraq's Arab Sunni population and would inevitably lead to sectarian contestations for power as the old guard fought to carve out their place in Iraq's modern nation state. Here again, Iraqi minorities found themselves in the crossfire during Iraq's civil war, leading to their internal displacement, mass exodus to neighboring countries and beyond. The outcome for Iraqi minorities would only worsen with the rise of ISIS and its eventual takeover of Mosul in 2014. The Yazidi genocide of 2014 in Sinjar saw 400,000 people killed, captured or forced to flee. Thousands now languish in Kurdish refugee camps or are adjusting to new host lands abroad. According to figures from UNHCR, there were 4.4 million internally displaced persons in Iraq in 2015, a year after the fall of Mosul. Finally, the intervention of 2003 has led to Iraq becoming a highly militarized and violent society. Lawlessness and a distrust in the government's willingness and ability to protect its populations has seen the development of a labyrinthine security apparatus that includes both formal and informal security institutions, including tribes, militias, the Iraqi security forces, the popular mobilization forces, Kurdish Asayev, Peshmergas and criminal gangs, in areas where there are ongoing disputes over territory, historical grievances, insecurity and fears of communities suspected of supporting Islamic State, amongst many other unresolved political conflicts, has meant that many governorates in Iraq remain sites of unpredictable conflict, which continue to displace Iraqi communities internally and drive others into refugeehood and poverty. Consequently, the displacement of Iraqi minorities since 2003 has created one of the most significant demographic shifts in Iraqi history. Minorities in Iraq comprised around 10% of the Iraqi population in 2003, but by 2010 and even before the 2014 threat from ISIS, that number had dwindled to 3%. I have argued elsewhere that minorities, particularly non-Muslim minorities, are therefore being erased from the Iraqi nation through a gradual and consistent process of nation destroying, which continues in Iraq in the shadows of the 2003 intervention and its legacy. Yet it's not only minorities who are migrating. Many are leaving Iraqi Kurdistan and Baghdad due to political instability, persecution of activists, journalists and students, some of whom form part of Iraq's Tashreen movement. And due to the restrictive migration policies of Western hostlands, however, Iraqis are taking more perilous journeys in their bid to migrate from Iraq, whether through the Turkish-Bulgarian border or on small boats to Europe. Indeed, Iraqi nationals are in the top five nationalities making their way to the UK in small boats according to recent Home Office statistics. At the same time, many Iraqi IDPs and refugees are still living in refugee camps and have been there for several years, with no legal status or hope of their situations improving as they have no homes or towns to return to, and importantly, no livelihoods to sustain them. Finally, 2003 and the violence it spawned also led to the emigration of Iraq's middle classes and skilled individuals in education and health, sectors in Iraq that are in desperate need of support. 
What we can see, therefore, is that the intervention of Iraq spawned an unprecedented level of forced migration in Iraq, which has affected all stratas of society, from the middle classes and all the way to, in the words of one UNHCR official I spoke with, the poorest of the poor. The legacy of 2003, therefore, not only changed the profile of migrants, but also the number of Iraqi migrants who've left the country now in their millions. Without the reconciliations, resolutions for the many political disputes that are the source of conflict, reparations for minority communities, and importantly, accountability and protection from the state, many more Iraqis will continue to leave Iraq. Uh, I think I will leave it there for now. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, we'll turn to Kali now to fit, close out the, the panel uh, opening remarks. Thank you. Um, I will mostly be speaking about the environmental effects of the occupation and the policies thereafter. Um, you know, because my research is focused on the environmental health impacts, I guess the answer to the question that you asked is I think policy is probably the most devastating impact of the occupation because it carries the echo of the violence that is mentioned in the chat by someone, these soldiers busting into children's homes at night or people being tortured in Abu Ghraib. Um, these are haunting memories that are actually legible on the landscape through these long-term toxic effects that people are, are continuing to talk about. So, um, you know, I've, I've taken exposure histories over 200 people and I'm asking questions uh, that might help understand the relationship between military exposure to toxins and reproductive health issues and cancer. Some of those questions though, I think speak to, to the comment in the chat. Um, I'm asking questions like, did you handle a dead body? Were you close enough to an explosion to smell smoke? Was your house burned or bombed? How many times was your house burned or bombed? So these toxic effects are so much more than material. And I wanna acknowledge that. I'm gonna reflect on three areas that attract a lot of political attention and try and make this a way of speaking back to some of the claims that we've been hearing in English speaking media that really offset responsibility onto Iraqi people or Iraqi society, but in fact are easy to link back to the US invasion. The first is going to be about birth defects, the second about burn pits, and then the third about the privatized recycling post-war green cleanup that I'm, that I'm hearing about. So um, a lot of talk about rebuilding Fallujah and how Anbar province is doing very well has been circulating. And I just wanted to go ahead, I'm gonna share my screen and show a few pictures. Um, this is a neighborhood in Fallujah. I took this picture two and a half weeks ago. Um, it's true that the wealthy are doing a lot of development work. The main strip of Fallujah is being rebuilt. And this is what privatization looks like when development is privatized. Um, so this is a neighborhood. You can see that there's what looks like maybe a missile crater. There are two cars here. One's abandoned. One has been um, blown up. Uh, in, in this place, in Fallujah especially, the epidemic of birth defects remains a figure of intergenerational impacts of US invasion. Occupation has a long shadow, and this isn't a metaphor. Women are facing a lot of fear, obstetric risks, repeated miscarriages, early infant death, and then they're unsupported when they have caretaking for children who face lifelong disabilities. Based on the exposure histories that we've done so far, I don't have enough statistically significant evidence to say this with any um, any certainty, but it seems like there's a pretty clear pattern that uh, construction workers who return home very soon after a battle are seeing a high rate of reproductive health issues. And that's because they're doing the dirty work of cleaning up from military violence. So after a big bombing campaign, like in 2004, um, people were coming back to do the reconstruction work that the US left behind for people to do. Um, we see a lot of blame uh, and people talk about corruption in Iraq, but this is the obvious outcome of US written privatization policies. I mean, what is corruption if not a public institution that siphons money off to private interests? Orders one through 100 made the health effects of birth defects lethal, um, even though there are other health concerns that are far more prevalent. Birth defects are much discussed in Iraq because the bodies of children are forming a kind of archive of this generation's deep violence. So I met a friend, um, I'm just gonna show you a picture of, sorry, these are out of order. This is Fallujah Hospital in the front. 
Um, I met a friend who's a, a child cardiologist a few weeks ago, and he told me this really um, illustrative story that he, a, a child was born, had a congenital heart defect that was serious, but it could have been corrected easily with a surgery. So he said, you know, go home, take your baby home. I know we only have a few weeks, but I need to scramble and get supplies. And this is sort of what medical life looks like for a lot of doctors who are working in the public sector rather than the private sector. So he found the tubing and some surgical supplies and he was just missing this one plastic piece that was required for the surgery. But he went ahead and had a meeting with the father while the child was waiting at home with just like a very, you know, maybe weeks to live without the surgery. And he goes over the procedure plan and he explains, you know, what he can expect for his daughter's surgery and the recovery process and exactly how it's going to go. And he talks for about 10 minutes and then the father stops him and he says, I'm, I'm sorry, doctor, but she died. Without equipped public hospitals, a completely treatable birth defect becomes lethal. So for children who are born today, the war on terror or the US invasion number two didn't start 20 years ago, it started today. And it continues to be lethal because of policies that were implemented by the US and reinforced by the last 20 years of policy making and policy practice. I'm gonna turn to burn pits now. Um, in burn pits, uh, you've probably been hearing about US veteran exposure to burn pits. And of course, Iraqis also live downwind of them. They are an environmental feature of Iraq's landscape. They're often in the form of a scar now. They're not necessarily active. During my last trip, I met with a family that was growing grass crops uh, where they're feeding their livestock. Let's see if I can get you a picture. Sorry. Um, this is not a picture of a burn pit. This is a picture of a field that is several miles downwind of one. Their land was not too far from where Camp Fallujah had a burn pit. And this family came and went during different military battles. Um, they always remember smoke in the backdrop. It was always changing, but always there, kind of like the weather. And Um Khalid, which is a pseudonym I use for, for this friend, he was an 18 year old newly, uh, sorry, she was an 18 year old newlywed during the US invasion. And then she ended up having two healthy children. Then she ended up coming back after being displaced and she suffered multiple miscarriages. She couldn't remember exactly how many. And then two stillbirths, very late term stillbirths. And then finally she had two more live births, but these were to children with anencephaly, which means they didn't have a head or brain. They're the, these are children born with mostly just a face and they didn't survive more than a few hours after being born. So now they're in their 40s and they have to change their farming practices. This is a family that told me their chickens are getting sick. Oftentimes they'll grow tumors. Even though it's been years since the burn pit itself was active, the toxic legacy remains. And Abu Khalid was himself diagnosed with cancer two years ago, and he was lucky enough to raise funds through his tribe to get early intervention. But his main concern, and same with Um Khalid, is that the value of their land has been so driven down by burn pits that they can't really move and they would like to, but they're saying like, who would ever buy this land? We're stuck and we can barely grow new lives on this land and we're gonna keep struggling to do so. But even they acknowledge that while the burn pit's very close to them and a major factor in their lives, it's kind of a drop in the bucket for what many Iraqis are dealing with environmentally. Uh, they're just not special because of the sheer destruction that the U.S. invasion induced. When we talk about burn pits, the thing that makes them military grade toxic, as opposed to all other kinds of industrial waste, is that these are the materials in the burn pits were military content, right? So we're talking about, yes, flat screen TVs, which are bad, but also like tank sidings and um, discarded missile shells. So I went to um, Congo last year with a colleague because that's where a lot of the minerals that are used in contemporary warfare are being mined and that they end up in burn pits. And I learned that the miners there are far more concerned with their chances of a mine shaft collapsing than of getting cancer because chemotoxic exposure is so much less toxic than the toxic relationships of labor production and the industry and structural violence of warfare. And I post that here because basically burn pits are like a receipt. 
in that they show us the toxic tally of war by aggregating all the material evidence of what war does and how it acts as a transnational economic structure. And it implicates a lot of people and institutions. So many of us have retirement funds that are invested in corporations like Raytheon or KBR who are complicit in this kind of war as industry, whether or not things are happening in a battle. Then I followed uh, from, from Congo being the cradle to the grave site that is, that is the burn pit. The question is where along this chain of supply um, does all of this war detritus end up, whether it's demolished houses that I showed you or, um, or the kind of metal fragments that are lying around. Because I'm really concerned that I'm, I'm more concerned about the next 20 years. Um, at this historical juncture, Iraq is going to face a long, long period of recovery, and we have a lot of great and creative activism and, um, and repair efforts. But one of the more destructive ones um, that I think could easily be framed as a green solution to managing war waste is alive and well in Iraq today. Um, this is an image of the post-war supply chain where heavy metals are being gathered and scavenged and shipped northward from the south to be recycled, quote unquote recycled. And as they're metabolized into the environment and to people's bodies for a second time, the exposures increase all the more. So this is a, a new industry. It's basically recycled metals being transformed into rebar that is the um, twin of the concrete industry in order to build really shoddy construction um, that's going to lead to the next Istanbul earthquake because this rebar is not going to be able to hold um, the buildings it's meant to build. But what's most interesting to me from a toxic perspective is that there's a preference in this industry for the heavier metals, the heavier the metal, the better, because it's stronger, but it's more brittle. And that means that military grade weapons are getting melted down, um, whether that's tank sightings or missile shells, and some of them have not been exploded yet. And so sometimes whole factories will explode. Um, and in this case, you can see light shining through the ceiling where there were some explosive components. All of the labor for this industry is imported. Um, all of the workers in this factory are from a rural village in India. Uh, in the concrete industry, many are from China. This is essentially what's happening to the privatization policies that were implemented by the US. And now 20 years later, we're seeing them in full scale. While the farmers in Bazian Valley, where this factory is, are trying to grow food in the dust and um, filthy water that this factory is producing, the factory workers are going to go home with respiratory illnesses and likely have reproductive health issues as well. Again, Iraq being the site of a web of transnational structural violence that the battles are just the beginning of. And so the next 20 years are going to be this huge fight for environmental regulation and protection that will include the bodies of laborers and newborn children and the plants and animals that are having to live in this massive project that simply cannot fully be cleaned up. It's just irreparable damage. So I'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, before we're going to open it up for um, audience questions and comments, I'd like to ask each of you a follow-up question. Um, so as, you know, Zaha sort of picked up on um, my introductory comments, the, the difficulty of talking about Iraq in, in terms of, you know, how much do we stress the structural injustice and, you know, the devastating impact without falling into the trap of portraying Iraqis just as passive victims, given all the creative resistance and coping strategies. So I think I want to sort of follow up on the latter part and um, prompt you and starting with Zahra to elaborate a bit more on the kinds of uh, creative resistance. So you talked a little bit about the Tishreen revolution uh, what happened to the young people on, on the street? And I know that you have been particularly interested in documenting the way that feminist activists, women's rights activists in Iraq have been resisting. And I, I 
would like to hear now you've you are in Baghdad you have been spending time how do you feel the situation has shifted right now in terms of um specifically women's rights activism but you know also the sort of aftermath of the Tishreen protests yeah thank you Nadia well as I often say, say like if you look at um I mean there are so many panels like our panels and most and most of these panels are like foreign policy kind of panels where you have like experts who come and they talk about Iraq from the top basically and of course they always have this devastating kind of <laughs> you know uh, um, um, statements it's all horrible and and it's all collapsing and it's all and and of course that some aspect of it is true but I guess because I'm much more of an ethnographer and a lot of us are looking uh, um, you know it's a much more diverse panel in terms of perspective we have literature we have you know anthropologists etc if if you look at actually the political from from the bottom as opposed to the political from the top you actually realize that there are so many things going on I mean this um, I mean Iraq is such a you know lively rich uh, society where there's there's where because actually Iraqis have been abandoned from the states and I would say from the whole world, <laughs> they have developed ways to cope in uh, at the level of the everyday. And this is also where when you talk about the everyday, which is really what I'm interested in, uh, you also talk about women who are at the core of the everyday, right? At women are life, they are they carry the everyday. They've been carrying the everyday even more than in other places because of war because men have died in in decades of war and so and so if you look at this you 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 really realize that um you know when for example today in Baghdad it's it's raining right and and when it when it rains it's always we, everybody gets so anxious because unless you live in a neighborhood and there are some neighborhoods like that like that but they are limited where uh, you know the roads are not full of of holes, and <laughs> it, you'll be okay. You can you can walk. Uh, but if you live in another kind of neighborhood, which is most of the neighborhoods in Baghdad and in Iraq, you you are gonna be flooded. So you like when it rain when it's rain. It's a fresh air, but at the same time, you know that it's gonna be a big flood, and that for a day or two you might not be able to circulate. And people have been dealing. I mean, neighborhoods have been organizing uh, um, around that in the south of Iraq when you know th there's a there's a big issue with with water. People people really are organized neighborhoods and and young people and older people distribute you know water. Um, and 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 this, I mean, from from my perspective, looking at women, looking at. Uh, you know their their role within the society, their roles, you know, socially, politically, etc. You realize that actually women are, are always at the forefront of all of these initiatives. Every, it always go through actually women. So this is kind of at the level of the everyday how how women have been really acting as substitute of uh, uh, of this, the lack of state institution and infrastructures, etc. Uh, and and facing this this really privatization. I mean, if you don't have more than seven hours of like state supported or public un um, electricity that also means that you you everybody has to have a generator just right now for me to have electricity uh, you need to pay at least 150 dollars if you want to have good quality electricity and this is march and in the summer the electricity cuts are even worse than that so basically if you pour if you're poor, you don't have access access to electricity you don't have access to running water in the summer you 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 your everyday life is a living hell uh, and so the way you survive is that there's, you know, local uh, mosques or, or, or you know, uh, um, groups, charity groups uh, uh, run by everyday people who, who are going to help you out. Um, so so then, then if you move to kind of the more societal, political, the organizing in a more formal way, um, I mean, women, uh, um, in addition to being uh, kind of the, at the forefront of the everyday, have been organizing, uh, and especially in the last decade, I think that there's a this kind of um, um, a connection between uh, women establishing more and more uh, organization. I mean, there's, for example, the Iraqi Women Network, there's the Organization of Women's Freedom in Iraq, there's, there's so many that, you know, there's 
the, the Iraqi feminist network, etc. So, so this is kind of developing. And of course, there was a in the first decade in particular, a, a real angelization of this type of activism because the US, of course, came with this neocolonial narrative. We're coming to bring democracy, we're coming to liberate women. So we're gonna, you know, like you, you wrote about that, Nadia. You we, we are gonna, you know, give millions of dollars to this organization and do like democracy mainstreaming and gender mainstreaming, etc. But in the past decade, actually, uh, along with the kind of intensification of of, of broader protests, protests for electricity, etc. Um, also, I think women's groups have been organizing at different levels, not only on at the NGO eyes level where, I mean, although it's still important to work on legal issues and quota and, and rights, etc. Uh, they have been organizing it around more, I mean, societal issues against the different forms of conservatism, social, societal, religious, etc. And, and, and I think that now the new generation of feminists, I mean, and I, I mentioned a little bit Thora Teshreen, Thore Tashrin, the, the, the average a, age of Thore Tashrin is like from 15 to 22 years old. So it's a, it's even, it's it's a younger generation that that which experience is is different from the experience of let's say the 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 woman middle class activist in her 40s, right? So this in in, in and among this young generation, there's there, there are there's a diversity of forms of, of feminisms and activism that that are developing that I would say are much more radical because in some ways the street is always much more radical than organized. Uh, sure. well-established organization right and this is something that I really I see very much I yeah. I, I feel you know with, with all of these back and forth in the last in the past decades mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes so I'll stop yeah. here <laughs> yeah okay great thank you yeah that's uh the sense that I've been getting I mean last year also reading your work uh Zahra and I'm going to turn to Khaled because I also have the feeling that in Iraq similar to elsewhere in the region where you had protest and where there is a disillusionment with traditional politics there is has been sort of a shift towards a cultural arena uh, to express dissent and to also express uh, alternative vision um, for the future and I was just wondering Khaled if you can sort of share a few ideas around the way that culture has become I mean culture in terms of you know literature art music has always been important mm -hmm. But at this specific moment, could you um, share some reflections? Please? Yeah, thank you, Nadia, for the question. I think, yeah, you're right. Literature um, works, I mean, as far as I can see it in my my disciplinary uh, uh, viewpoint, it, it works in a it's it doesn't obviously work in a direct way with the with the uh, with the trigger and the response. It, 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 it works in a more I mean, these impulses translate into aesthetic uh, 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 techniques maybe or uh, as I always worry about treating literature as like a historical or sociological document in that sense but I think what's happening in that uh, that that a lot of people have seen in the last 20 years is that there's a very vibrant uh, culture of of, of literature in terms of not just in poetry that uh, you know Iraq has been uh, traditionally historically known to be the the, the place of uh, innovation and in poetics but also in the production in terms of the uh, amount of the outpouring of, of novel production and uh, and what I pointed out is the I uh, is something that I've seen that I've I've seen happen in in many not just in in literature itself but also as a debate among uh, people who are invested in the field of literature in terms of the way memory and the uh, as a response to the erasure of like the communal and collective memory and the national memory and how that manifests in in, in literature itself and how that had that always sometimes ends up to be the focus on space and giving that space uh, a complex layering of history and 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 uh, and uh, and even mythical and cultural dimensions that don't that I don't think existed before in that sort of richness, but you see that in literature, uh, in in novels and fiction, uh, uh, specifically, you see that sort of trend where uh, there's a debate happening that to to to. Uh, think of li literature not only as a receptacle of communal memory, but also as something that could 
um, um, you know, uh, be a document for the generations to come and, and all of that, yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Khaled. Well, um, Ola, I uh, was wondering, I mean, you you have been working on transnational mobilization of diaspora communities and focusing on Iraqi refugees. So uh, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about that. Uh, what specific aspect of it would you like? Me well, to? I mean, in terms of, you know, what kind of transnational mobilization have you mm -hmm. seen? Uh, and I mean, I, I remember in the past when I did work on Bosnian refugees trying yeah. to be involved in the reconstruction of the homeland without returning. Yeah. So yeah, no, of course, it's just there's so much. I mean, there's been yeah, yeah. so much, of course. And 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 I've been looking um, quite broadly into diaspora politics. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of taken from the elite level in terms of the kind of opposition years and post 2003 years um, with the elites but also interestingly from the grassroots level uh, in terms of how ordinary Iraqis in the diaspora have attempted to help in the rebuilding of their country of origin, whether that be in supporting you know, communities on the local level, whether that's um, supporting um, different sectors such as the health and education, um, the bringing sort of doctors to Iraq, like roaming doctors to help in reaching those far access places, helping with at times the migration of vulnerable communities who've been targeted um, specifically during Iraq's civil war, um, helping with them to relocate, helping with livelihoods. I mean, it's really a broad, a broad spectrum in terms of the, the transnationalism that's, that's occurring. I mean, more recently, I mean, what I found is that these the transnationalism that have echoed have been very much in direct response to what's been happening in Iraq on the ground. So they kind of echo and respond to events there. Um, so, you know, during, for example, um, the threat from ISIS, you see a huge mobilization here in the UK in support of widows and orphans and um, supporting those who've been killed, communities and uh, families. Um, this was really a, a big, a big drive. For example, more recently with Tashreen, you also see huge digital activism from the diaspora in support of Iraqis. New organisations that have popped up in support of solidarity protests, lobbying governments. So it's a really, really wide spectrum of transnational activities that are occurring between Iraq and its its now global diaspora. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Kali, listening to you and seeing pictures of Fallujah, I mean, I remember in the 90s, um, there was, and also Basra, talking about Basra, um, I'm thinking depleted uranium when I think toxicity, and I'm sort of wondering if that is uh, still very much at the forefront, especially when it comes, of course, to reproductive health. And I, I mean, I do remember women talking to women in the 90s who said that they were afraid of getting pregnant because of depleted uranium. So I, I was wondering about that, but I'm also wondering, given the large scale of challenges that Iraqis are facing, um, is there an envi environmental activism? Is there, a, I mean, you said that there's creative activism happening. And so I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on that. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, unfortunately, depleted uranium is probably not the worst thing that people are experiencing. Um, it's exotic and it's linked with war very clearly. So something like lead is a less popular chemical to focus on. Um, but this sheer inundation of heavy metals, but everything else as well, probably the compounded effects are more serious than, um, than depleted uranium alone. But of course it remains a major concern and a center of discourse. I think a lot of these things are figures of the broader problem. And so that's an important um, thing to foreground is if people are using um, depleted uranium as an analytic tool to think about other forms of harm, listening to that and thinking that through is really helpful, even if it ends up not being the epidemiological answer. Um, Doctors have told people some of these families in Fallujah don't get pregnant. Like you simply can't, you will not conceive children who can survive. 
it's really serious. Um, and as you can imagine, the social impact is, is extreme. Uh, meanwhile, there are incredible activists, especially around the rivers. I think the, the Water Defenders is just one name that this sort of grassroots coalition um, of great young people, but, but actually people of all ages who, who love the Tigris and Euphrates and identify it as a political actor in their lives and the source of, of survival um, is really inspiring in part because uh, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers run through all of Iraq's territories and then force the kind of collaboration and discourse that other kinds of social divisions or political divisions have stymied. And so that's one group that I spend a lot of time talking to and working with. But the other thing that I really respect and enjoy about many of the farming communities that I that I work with is they're just stubborn and um, enduring is probably one of the most intense forms of resistance I can ever imagine. Like in, in population centers where protests are highly effective, that works. But if you're in the middle of a field uh, in a small village, the most transgressive thing you can do to confront these major policy sweeps is to just outlast them. Mm -hmm. And the sheer intergenerational stubbornness that I'm witnessing as people are like sticking to their land is incredibly um, political. And, and it counts, even though I don't think it often registers in discourse. People often cite the, the Hadith that right, that like, if you're holding a date palm on the last day of earth, plant it. And I think a lot of people really feel that that's exactly what they're doing, that that for a lot of people who have a long memory of what Iraq is or was, uh, they're watching the death of their country and they're going to plant date palms anyway. And they're going to make sure that they insist on outlasting whatever destruction comes their way. Um, they've seen many different occupations and, and civilizations come and go. And so there is a, a like a fellahin, like a, a farmer ethos that I think is a kind of political activism we don't discuss very often when we focus on urban centers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. Well, I see that we have some questions and comments in the Q&A. So Stephanie, would you like to continue? Yes, um, thank you. And I would just like to open the chat box for um, all of our audience members at this point. Please do type in your questions um, and, and we'll, we'll try to open it up for a, a live Q&A. Um, that way, I'm just going to pose one of the questions from the chat right now. Um, we won't get to all of them, of course, but um, I, uh, I think this dovetails really nicely with what we were just talking about. Um, so, you know, it's just incredible to hear these stories of the, the resistance and the activism. And um, I'm wondering now that we've kind of grounded ourselves in this kind of bottom up sense of resilience. Um, what about the top down, especially from this unique set of panelists? Um, there was a question uh, about um, accountability um, you know, it, thinking about the damage inflicted by the U.S. invasion and the responsibility of the Iraqi government towards the, you know, the current set of, of what this, uh, this audience member calls social, economic, ecological, and political impairment. So let's think about the future. Let's think about, um, you know, the, the kind of top-down policymaking that, that you would like to see happen and that you um, think about when you think about uh, things like responsibility and accountability and a kind of future orientation towards providing for well-being on a really broad scale. Um, and I, I don't want to pick on anyone in any panelist in particular because it's a very uh, tough question, but um, but I'd like to just open it up to all of you if you have any thoughts about both um, you know Iraqi government uh, and US uh, US government in relation to these questions. Can I go? Yes, please. Um, the U.S. owes Iraq reparations. I think that this is like the least, uh, maybe the most straightforward. But what does that actually look like? And and maybe I'm speaking just to the American audience in this moment. But the first step is public apology and acknowledging that what the U.S. did and continues to do in Iraq is wrong. Um, and it also includes actual redistribution of resources, right? Like resources have and continue to be plundered 
from Iraqi people and from Iraq's landscape. And that that's the policy component. Like that wasn't just the initial invasion. It's the kind of the kind of laws that have produced what we're calling corruption, but is in fact the privatization and siphoning of resources from Iraq. That plunder never stopped. And as I mentioned in my talk, it isn't just on Iraqi territory that that plunder is happening. So if this is a corporate war, and we know that there were corporate profits, it's also evolved from both a US policy campaign to actually publicly acknowledge the US government's responsibility in Iraq and its continued colonial practices, but it also means actually holding corporations accountable. And this looks like a boycott and divestment campaign. We've done this before. Um, people can pull their money out of the companies that are com still complicit in this enterprise. This is not an event, it's a structure. And a third thing is just at minimum, um, the PACT Act was a successful campaign by veterans to get health coverage and, and some of their costs and care coverage based on their exposure to burn pits. That's one really simple example that could be extended to Iraqis who are downwind and facing the exact same medical criteria that would qualify for them uh, that kind of care. So that's, you know, a couple hundred thousand families right there. And then, you know, I alone as an anthropologist have done a couple interviews and been able to clearly identify the property damage that people faced during US occupation, whether it was having to rebuild their house twice or damage to their artwork. I mean, these are like very easy to quantify and redistribute individually. It doesn't require like an NGOized process. So I think we really need to have a conversation, not about whether the US owes reparations, but exactly how that would be implemented and it, it seems like the first step really is to stop corporate extraction. And this is not a tactic unfamiliar to those of us who know what transnational justice looks like when governments are not the only actors in the picture. Yeah, to, to continue on that, thank you so much for putting this out. Uh, so so this, these are you know, very concrete things, but, and also I think that at a time where, um, and, and, and you know we, we we are speaking to an American audience right now, and I think it's super important. I mean, along with reframing the discourse around this war, right, and, and talking about invasion, occupation, devastate, devastation, destruction, uh, the fact that the U.S. put in place a brutal regime that is um, repressing dissent, that is, I mean, that, that is really, really, really far away from the democracy that. Uh, some people like Paul Bremer, who are still writing articles saying that the Iraq, that it was a good thing and that it was a good example compare, comparing it to Afghanistan. I mean, there, there's still some work to do in, in reframing, in changing the discourse. But it's true that uh, the more concrete way to do it is actually to concretely talk about reparation, especially in a context in which everybody's talking about racial reckoning, right? And that Everybody's talking, I mean, everybody, a lot of people even are using, even banks now are, are using the, you know, terminologies such as decolonizing, et cetera. So there is a moment now uh, in the US where, I mean, and it's really done on the shoulder of grassroots activism uh, for black lives, for example, and also grassroots uh, activism of uh, um, indigenous people. Uh, I feel that this link hasn't, is, is absolutely not clear. And that the, the relationship between racism, between you know connecting the, the very foundation of the nation states uh, um, through genocide and, and slavery, and connecting it with empire and imperialism is, is absolutely central. So when we're talking, although I mean there are things that we can't compare, but talking about connections is very important. The fact that uh, El Iraq and Afghanistan are completely missing from this conversation. That that there's no there's no discourse really uh, when when we are thinking at the moment uh, rightly about uh, uh, reparation uh, uh, for people within the U.S. territory. There's no conversation about the victims outside of the U.S. territory, and I think that you know pointing out that Iraq, just like Vietnam, is is really present in the everyday life of Americans in in its military industrial complex, in its normalization of police violence, in its anti-black, anti-immigration racism, uh, in its neo-colonial white femis feminism, in so many aspects of, of people's social, economic, um, and political life, is, is really, really also central. Um, although, uh, and maybe I'll finish on that to leave space for others, 
Although my only worry um, in talking about reparation is that then we, we also get stuck. Uh, and I think that's something that a lot of um, other contexts, I mean, for example, I'm, I'm speaking of, uh, I'm thinking of what happened with the Mau Mau, uh, you know, when, when um, uh, in, in Kenya, et cetera. A lot of also, I mean, activists and scholars were, were saying in some ways, um, you know, reparation is, is very important, but it also, um, it also imprison us in in talking about the empire and in being in constant conversation about you know uh, the empire and in being really stuck with the empire so i think we need to do that and at the same time emphasize the fact that you know people also have moved on and and, and there are other things going on <laughs> so i'll stop here um i'd like to add a little bit more on that if, if possible because i was thinking about exactly this idea of reparations and really trying to think about what that might actually look like I mean it's, it's easy to say and but how what, what would it look like on the ground and I think I completely agree with you Callie in that we you know an apology would be a good start you know an apology for the Iraq war might have Iraq war Iraq invasion let's just correct the language to begin with the intervention and occupation might be a good place to start but in terms of reparations, I mean, there's so much more what the UK, the US could do. I mean, I was just reading <clears throat> before I came on this panel about the situation of, of poverty in Iraq. I mean, a quarter of the population is under the poverty line. We are talking about 11 million Iraqis. How can a country with the oil wealth that Iraq has be in such dire poverty? So there needs to be redistribution. How can it be that 21 million of Iraqis are young school age children, 50% of whom schools can't get access to water? How can this be? And of course, this all has implications for who goes to school. And the first who suffer, of course, becomes a gendered issue. Females and women and young girls don't get to go to school. Um, this is really hugely problematic. So for me, part of the reparations is actually the rebuilding, the rebuilding of Iraq's infrastructure, particularly education and health. These are crucial and they are sectors that are really, really in need because of the brain drain, because of the effects of a lack of people left in Iraq to actually do the training, which then just adds to this sort of brain drain cycle, which is as more people leave, there are less people there to train, um, less people do the training. So it's all quite linked. But then it sort of goes back to what you're saying as well, um, Zahara, because when I start thinking about these reparations, I start thinking, well, this is also some kind of intervention. And do we want more intervention by, by the US? You know, it, it, it becomes a form of, of neo-colonialism. It can be. And so we have to be very, very careful, I think, when we're talking about reparations. And this is really something that I think we need to bring back to Iraqis inside Iraq and have that conversation of what would reparations look like for Iraqis? What kind of change would they like to see? Um, but then, sorry, just one last thing I'd like to add on that, which is let's not forget, um, it's not all in the US. I mean, the Iraqis have been running the show now for <laughs> since 2003 and, and they must not um, on whatever grounds be let off here. Um, the governance in Iraq, this ethno-sectarianism, the violence, the civil wars, the conflicts, these are all have gone since 2003 unaccountable. The protests, the, ki the killings, the targeted killings, the minorities who have not been protected, they are all in need of reparations. They are all in need of protection. Who the disappeared in Iraq, I was just reading the number of disappeared in Iraq is, is colossal. Where are the, where is the accountability here by the Iraqi government and the Iraqi state to say, this is what's happened. We are sorry, we are, we are changing because it's without that accountability. How does trust get created between citizens and their governance and the rule of law actually has any meaningful impact? So we need to start with our internal problems here as well in, in, in Iraq um, and have actual accountability for all the violence, for all the disappeared, for all the families who've suffered. Yeah, I mean, uh, Khaled, did you want to come in here as well? Yeah, just a quick comment in line with the, uh, just the idea of acknowledgement and recognition and uh, 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 
of what's happened in Iraq in the past few decades. Uh, a lot of the discussion here in the US when people tend to, and it, it happens a lot when I read uh, book reviews about uh, new novels about Iraq, it always comes to it comes down to what are the veterans saying about Iraq? What are the veterans writing about Iraq? And there's a whole institution that, that, that's, in, that's put in place to serve that purpose. To, a lot of veterans seem to uh, do their um, uh, weeks or months in Iraq. And when they come back, they, they go through the MFA program and they produce narratives about Iraq. And that seems to be always the response to what's happening over there. Let's read uh, the, uh, Phil Clay, let's read uh, Matt Gallagher, let's read Kevin Powers and all of that to know what's happening in Iraq. And it's always, this is what, it, it's, it's always, it's a perspective that's limiting and limited to say, uh, to say a little, um, and it's uh, there are a lot of writers uh, in Iraq that have been translated inside and outside. Uh, Sinan Antoun is a brilliant novelist and poet who is based in the U.S. Uh, his a lot most of his work, I think, all of his work has been translated. Mehsen um, Ramli, um, based in Spain, his work has been translated to multiple languages. Um, um, Ahmed Saadawi, his book uh, Frankenstein in Baghdad has been uh, shortlisted for and, and won many awards. Uh, so it, for, for, to, to, I think it also starts with just the uh, idea to seek the knowledge uh, and the literature of the people that we're uh, that we need to learn about, as opposed to uh, something else. Yeah, thank you. Um, your comment, Khaled, actually links to something I was going to mention in response to a comment by an audience member who is disappointed that our panel does not include a U.S. military veteran scholar um, or a human terrain system social scientist. And uh, it's precisely because much of the U.S. A mainstream media policy, but also academic and expert discourse is doing precisely that looking at Iraq through a very US centric lens. And as much as um, I think we all you know, respect the role that Iraq veterans have played in raising consciousness about the impact. I mean, our aim here today is to actually focus on the Iraqi side. And I think that's has been really part of the, as Khaled, I, I very much agree with you, the, um, the problem in, in, in the United States, that it's through this lens of how is it affecting us, the United States. Um, but I also think that Ola's uh, comment is really important that, um, you know, while Zaha is right, you know, we cannot uh, dismiss or we should not dismiss the impact of the occupation and the invasion, we also cannot dismiss the um, responsibility of corrupt Iraqi politicians. Um, and, you know, when we look at especially the kind of full circle that we've come to in terms of authoritarianism and political repression. Um, but let me, uh, we have just a few minutes left. So let me try to get to um, a couple of questions. I'm just going to read out um, a few questions and you can pick up any. So um, Peter Chatelier is asking, what are Iraqi parents advising their teenage children to do with their lives? Um, we, uh, okay, so there is James Harkin who's asking, how do you break these stories into mainstream media which requires facing up to consequences of the US invasion? And Khalid Naas asked, does the entire political system of, of Iraq have to change in order to fix the environmental crisis? Do you think Iraqis need extreme before reform or even another revolution? Um, so we just have a few minutes left. So um, anyone would like to respond to any of the questions? I could just say, yeah, I could just say something. I mean, um, there's so much to say, but <laughs> um, I mean, since we are this this panel is happening we're speaking in english it's 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 we are addressing an american audience right so so uh, for example i mean uh Ola, we didn't we didn't talk that much about the uk we should have you know if it was for example we should right but we also uh, decided to focus on the us because of, of the frame of this panel so what i would like to say is 
that what we what is needed in the US right now <laughs> is an anti-war movement, is a true anti-war movement, is a true transnational solidarity movement, is really to renew, revive uh, transnational solidarity, to understand that Iraq is not this faraway place that actually we all live in the same system, which is uh, you know colonial, patriarchal, brutal, extractivist capitalist system and that within this system some people are in the margins and are paying the consequences of this system and that some people are benefiting from this system right and so and, and of course it's not all black and white some people in the global south also are benefiting from the system but just globally this is the system in which we live in we all participate in it in a way or another and so what we need to understand is that there's no far away and here and there there's one system and that if we're talking about environmental issues, the US Army is the biggest polluter in the world. If we are talking about racial justice, the US Army has destroyed uh, entire countries such as Iraq and Afghanistan and, and, and devastated the lives of millions of people. Is that even, you know, Black and Latinx people are also the first target of, of military kind of propaganda in this country as well. So there's something to be said along the line of, of the calls for racial justice, along the lines of the call against you know, police crimes and, and disbanding the police, there's something to be said about the US being an empire, the US um, sustaining its hegemony, hegemony within a cruel capitalist system. Even more in a context where everybody's talking about what's happening in the Ukraine, in, in Ukraine, et cetera, I think we need to replace and, and, and name the US for what it is, an empire that has devastated millions of lives and, 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 and people need to reckon with that. And, and I think that renewing the anti-war movement is, is, is for me the most viable thing that we can do. Thank you, Zahra. Anyone else would like to say something before we close? No? Stephanie, would you like to say a few words? I think that was a brilliant way to end the panel. Um, and I would like to just um, read a comment from the audience. Um, just, uh, you know, really hoping for a panel like this in a rocky point of view and not a bunch of US academic talking heads. So I think uh, people are really appreciative of uh, of the hearing your perspectives. I know I certainly am. And um, I think, you know, part of what we're trying to do with this conversation, Zahra, in answer to your comments and, and certainly at the Costs of War Project is contribute to exactly what you're describing, um, uh, you know, transnational anti-war movement and, um, and uh, you know, a conversation like this is a really rich way to continue that. And um, so I thank you all so much for being here. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie, for co-hosting. Thank you all. And uh, this uh, event will be available. We make it available in a few days time, the recording. So hope you can share it with your friends and colleagues. I'd like to thank you all. And um, I hope we continue the conversation. I know I'll be seeing some of you uh, in a couple of weeks. So, um, yes, I wish you all the best and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.